Yeah, this one. Do they point somewhere? Shouldn't uh, matter. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean, move from this one. We don't have time. So these are the outlines about the things that we are going to discuss. Uh, yeah. So about irrigation management. What do? Why do we need irrigation management for crops? Like one part we are talking about, in, you know, safety for environment. We are talking about this uh like soil erosion through irrigation we're talking about you know preventing uh, deep percolation for water when you apply too much also about salinity to prevent salinity from accumulating on the surface of the soil and uh you know avoiding excess chemicals sometimes you apply chemicals in the irrigation systems we wanted to make sure that apply you know the exact amount that we need to apply and also there is another side which is sustainability for our water, we are all aware about the, you know, our situation that we have to reduce our water use. Um, same thing for the fertilizer. I've seen an invoice for fertilizer when I visited Ron. It was, uh, I, I saw a number really near 900,000 or something like that. It, that. That was a very big number for me. I've never expected something like this. We wanted to make sure, you know, also we know apply fertilizer. You know, apply the right amount. It's applied sometimes in the irrigation systems. Same thing for energy. Some people, when I talk to them about like drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, start talking about energy, cost of energy. It's too much, right? So if we apply the exact amount, we don't have to spend lots of money on energy. And same thing for labor, right? We don't have enough labor, even at Mac. When we try to do something, we have fewer number of people. So I'm sure under shortage of labor and the cost of labor as well, would like to make sure that we reduce our irrigation amount and it consequently reduce our labor use. Is it already? Oh, you have to present it. Oh, there you go. Point it this way. Maybe try pointing it here. It shouldn't. Ah, uh, you know. Oh, I need to improve. It's your magnetic personality. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the reason. Okay, so for irrigation management, like what do we have to do? What are the parameters we need to measure? First thing we talk about soil moisture. So, you know, advanced methods, we are talking about sensors. There are lots of new sensors in the market. There are a lot actually that may need some, you know, calibration stuff like that, but there are a lot in the market. Some of them are good, some are bad. But in general, I have seen it in lots of farms that people are using sensors now to detect soil moisture content and helping them with irrigation like scheduling. Uh, that's not enough. We need also to you know, see the weather data. We have lots of azimuth weather stations in all over Arizona that can provide like very good you know, uh, weather data, like you know, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and other things that's needed for you know irrigation models to be able to calculate water water use also crop data you know would like to know which crop is that would like to know the root zone i mean the root depths at each stage we get some measurements for example the canopy cover we need that as well to determine how much water is needed uh, and we use all this data to calculate what's called crop evapotranspiration which can be done through models very easy but the farmer doesn't have to deal with models. Basically, there are lots of models that use phone applications where you can put all this information in your phone to give you, you know, uh, estimate of when you need to irrigate. But we need also to consider the different water resources. For example, before we used to have water coming from the Colorado River, which would be different from the current situation where we have to pump water. When it comes to the next thing, which is water quality, for example, we have like higher salinity, you know, in the wells compared to the other water. So we have to consider that when we deter to determine how much water is needed in each irrigation event. Okay. 
it's like it's mine. Someone else maybe has to do it. Here, there you go. <laughs> now it took all of them. Forever. So you cannot point there. You have point to point there. there. Ah. Okay. There you go. Weird. But so next one, we have some considerations. Like we talked about like sensors and stuff like that, but some things you can like practice you can do to also save water and reduce all the hassle during irrigations. For example, when you use like heavy machinery on areas that sweat, it will result in something like what's in this picture, which is not good. Uh, we have to consider using like more efficient systems. I'm not talking about this one specifically, which is a gravity drip that has lots of advantages, right? But it may, because this system doesn't require like energy, you know, as they say, it doesn't require any like um, filtration, stuff like that. But at the same time, there are other like systems like subsurface drip irrigation system, which is really good. So, you know, you choose the best system for you, but at least should be efficient. We shouldn't depend on flood irrigation. You know, right now we should move to more efficient irrigation systems uh, like this one as well. You know, they call it LEPA, which is a kind of center pivot that applies water near the surface. So you apply the right amounts. You don't have runoff. You don't have uh, loss of evaporation like other systems. So we are saving. We are saving water. Same thing for the sprinklers. I've seen lots of sprinkler systems, and they are using for alpha, alpha, and other groups. And you are very efficient. You know how much exactly they are applying. Like one farmer told me, he applies like five acre feet per uh, year for alfalfa, alpha, which is a very good number. Actually, it should be around six. He's applying five. He's getting the same yield as others only because he's using a more efficient system like the center pivots. Uh, also, we should look for, you know, some crops that may save water. I know not everyone is happy with Wyoli, you know, when I mention it, because, you know, they are not sure about it right now. But there are other things, like, for example, corn. You know, I would show you some data that would indicate that it can tolerate some, some stress. Also, one of the considerations is salinity, right? We are going toward well water that has more salinity. So we have to consider leaching the salt below the root uh, zone. So how do we know how much extra we need to apply? So if you are applying this much, you need to apply, let's say 15% extra or maybe 10, right, for leaching. So leaching would depend on two things, salinity for the water, which is the x-axis, the uh, y-axis salinity of the soil itself. So if you determine both, for example, one is close to three, the other one is around seven, so you would meet at like 15%. So you need to apply 15% more to get rid of, rid of the salt, right? Oh. But so we, other things that we can do is the deficit irrigation. We try the deficit irrigation with Wyoli at Maricopa Agricultural Center, where we tested different, you know, scenarios. Like one would receive one irrigation per year, another three irrigation per year. One would skip every other irrigation, right? So this is for the Wyoli, but for other crops, there are other techniques. For example, alpha, alpha during the summer, you may, you know, stress it a little bit because the yield anyways is less than, you know, um, what's typical for, Alpha, alpha, but for Wyoli, for example, we tested different treatments. And uh, data indicated that when we cut every other irrigation, actually, we didn't affect our yield significantly. Like, if you can take a look at this, this is the yield of, after cutting the water, reducing the water used to about 2.5 acre feet per year, compared to this one, which is receiving every irrigation about four point something, I think. And the difference is not significant. There is a little bit of difference, but it's not significant. This is in the Wyoli case, but for example, we are talking also about alpha alpha. We can stress it. If you take a look at that curve, we reduced alpha alpha by about 50% the water use, right? I'm not us, I'm sorry. This is an experiment done in Utah by another scientist. Um, uh, actually, I'm collaborating with him now. I didn't know him before I put this in a previous presentation, but he's collaborating with us on an alpha, alpha experiment in, in the future. So uh, what happened is, you know, we have reduction about 50%, which resulted in the first cut, we have no significant difference between, you know, the one receiving full amount, the one receiving 50% of the amount, right? But if, and if you take a look also about here, which is like nutrients and stuff like that and quality, it, they were not affected. So you can stress, you know, alpha, alpha, 
right? However, uh, as I said, it's mainly to be like in the summer yeah. and fall, not, not during the spring, right? Uh, this one is for cotton experiment also done at Maricopa Agriculture Center with it, where they applied 100% of crop evapotranspiration and they applied 70% of crop evapotranspiration. And the, the experiment took place in three years during the first year and the third year. You know, there is a difference in yield, but it's not big. Like from, for the land, it's from 1470 to 1230. Since in third year, in the, you know, the 2017 was a little bit different, right? So cotton is the same way, you can stress it. However, it shouldn't take place during the first 80 days. So you should let it go for about 80 days, then you can apply any stress you'd like to apply. Uh, this is for corn, you know, same, same way. They apply different treatments. This is fully related, 25, 50. As you can see, the 50% is about similar to the 100%. So for corn, you know, uh, only consideration you need to do it, it has to happen during the entire year, right? Not like alpha, alpha focus on a certain growth stage or time of the year. It has to happen, the stress or the reduction in water use has to happen during the entire uh, year. And this one for small grains, yeah, there is a significant difference when you reduce it to 50%, right? But I mean, given that we are in a situation where we sometimes we may not have an option, actually, the amount of water is reduced. Every time the, you know, they had way higher water allocation, now it's, you know, it's what well, availability of water is changing now. So we have, even if we have to reduce the final yield, because we are applying this water, we may, this may be what, like our only option at one point. So we have to consider something like that, even though there is a little bit of significant difference here. Um, some things we can use to reduce our water use practices as well, like using mulching, for example, in some situation and using soil amendments. Uh, the bank and I are, are testing one of the soil amendments currently at one of the fields at Maricopa Agriculture Center. They claim that it can, you know, uh, improve our uh, water holding capacity, so it would hold water better, for example, in uh, sandy loam soils and sandy soils. Uh, plant residue, residues, I think the banker talked in his previous presentation about something like that. If you mix it in the soil, it would be better. Also, it will help reducing the uh, water use. Uh, uh, about the crop, we talk about crops like we can choose crops that can tolerate like water stress. Uh, one of the crops would be oil, as I said, but some other crops they have a toler some tolerance to water stress. We can also use drones. I mean, they are not very complicated as before. Now we can have a cheap drone that will give you very reasonable data about your field where areas they need like more water, they're not receiving enough water, they're getting too much water in here, for example. So these drones, the, in the beginning, for example, when you fly it, it was manually, I would say, now it's all automated. So you can fly it, let it fly, finish the mission in your farm, even if it's 100 acre, 200 acre, whatever, it will come back land in the same area, right? So automation is really nice and the prices are getting lower. So I think you can utilize that, but also there is, other like free satellite data that you can look at online. And there is also like some, uh, you know, something like open ET. You know, we are having an experiment on that. They use what's called open ET. So they use satellite data along with some specific information about the field to give you estimates of your water use. We're testing to see if that's very accurate or not. We will test it. We didn't start it. I actually I talked to Ron about it and he agreed to let us use his field for that. But in general, there are lots of use for satellite data and this technology to help you manage your irrigations. Okay, so now we talk about sensors. What, why do we need sensors? Sensors would be for weather data, for example, temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation, stuff like that. All these are parameters needed to estimate your water use. And also we can take some measurements for the soil. So this is for weather, this is for the soil, like, you know, soil pH, soil moisture content, salinity. And we have some plant measurements as well, as I said, using, you know, drone or uh, satellite data to give you some estimates of the condition of your crop, whether it needs more water, 
like stressed or whether it's in good condition. <clears throat> and some other sensors are used actually inside the stands. You call it uh, some uh, one like this. You call it sap flow. Or you put something in the tree to give you the water content inside the plant to see if it's when you can use it to actually help you manage irrig irrigation as, as well. Uh, this is one of the sensors I'm using in my field. I've seen it in other fields at farmer's field. Uh, basically, it gives you limits. Like this is a maximum, this is a minimum. If you are within these two, you're good. So they would give daily updates for the uh, grower. Okay, here is your water, soil moisture content. Now we think you need to irrigate. You are good, something like that. So it's very good guidance. It's not very accurate, but it's good enough for commercial use. This one is called Aqua Spy and it gives you more information about like your root system, how deep it is and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, now we talk about controllers. So we use controllers for irrigation, especially for drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation for sure. So you may have like an automated start and stop. So to give you, you put the time where you need to start the irrigation, the time when it needs to end. So it will help you use that. So this is the simplest. I would say uh, controllers. Uh, of course, it would save you time and labor because you didn't need someone to go present there and attend the irrigation. If you have a, you know, more efficient irrigation system, uh, and pro for for example, the water application accuracy, like you apply the exact amount that you need to apply, but of course based on time, and uh, you know, doesn't require maintenance, and it can be programmed. So it can control many stations. One is. You know, irrigating from this time to that time, another one irrigating different time. So it's not for only one uh, station. Uh, but there are new uh, controllers that can that are be based that would be based on climate. For example, it can give you based on temperature or you know uh, uh, like rain and stuff like that. So it can it can start or stop the irrigation based on weather condition. And there are others based on soil moisture where it's connected to a sensor like this one. When it reaches a center, certain level, for example, given by this or by aqua spire or whatever, it will start the irrigation and it would, you know, uh, give you like exact amount that you need to apply based on this data. Oh. Other sensors are combining both using weather data and sensors in the soil. So it can use both and mix them and give you the decision of when to irrigate. Okay. But I wanted to remind you that all these sensors in the market, they have very different, you know, they are not very accurate, or let's say not, not all of them. So we should make sure that we use the right sensor. For example, this study, it's not done by us, but someone else, compared uh, all these sensors, including the aquas vice that I showed you, to what's called neutron moisture meter, which is a very good, accurate soil moisture meter that we use in our research. And as you can see, if soil moisture content is this value in here, that one would give it as 13 or 0.13. This is 22, 17, 27 even, which is more than double this one, right? So there is a very good variability. And this is a number coming from factory, right? So when you try to actually try to calibrate or something like that, it would even give you like different numbers. We have to make sure that we use the right sensor. In my opinion, you know, the aqua spice that I'm using is not bad. I mean, compared to all these high numbers in here. So we have to make sure that we choose the right uh, sensor. Okay, so we get all this information from the sensors and, you know, irrigation models and weather data and stuff like that. We use it in an irrigation model. So we get the soil moisture data, okay? And with our data, we calculate what's called probe evapotranspiration. Okay, and we use that, okay, we have our uh, water used during the past week. So we use that to determine how much to apply and when to apply it. And then uh, how much to apply and when to apply. As I said, the model gave you estimate of how much irrigation need to apply or and when. And also there is another option, which is very simple. This uh, paper is from the eighties. I've seen it in farmers' hands, they use it, right? Which was surprising to me. Uh, nice thing about it, give you every week. Oh, so the first two weeks, you need to apply this much. The second two weeks, you need to apply this much. So to give you guide as you go, so you can use it to apply predetermined amount if you don't want to use uh, like weather data <laughs> and stuff like this. You need something simple, you can use something like this, you know, like this curve. 
Okay. So as I said, there are models, and I, I'm not talking about farmers dealing with models and trying to insert it and stuff like that. No, it's very simple. They leave this to, you know, for universities and stuff like that. And I think there are companies also that provide this type of data. So typically, the model would use, you know, weather data along with some crop coefficient data, you know, based on research. It uses also some uh, crop information, like what type of crop, the height of crop, the depth, and stuff like that. And uh, some information about soil moisture content using sensors, and you combine all this, you put it in the model, and it can give you estimate of how much wa water depletion from your root zone, how much water you need to apply, when is your irrigation. For example, if it says apply this much in that date, if you delay, the model would update itself. Oh, does a farmer have to deal with that? No, as I said, there are lots of applications available now for free where you can put some information about your field location. It can even ex get some uh, soil texture data from, you know, uh, automatically. So you don't have to even give him soil moisture data. You put, and then uh, when did you plant? When was the last irrigation? And some other information, then the model will give you daily updates of how much, uh, how many days left for your next irrigation, how much water you need. Yeah, this is a type of model. It's a model created by, uh, sorry. Okay, a model created, it's called WENS, created by a professor at the University of Arizona. It can give you soil moisture content in the root zone, how much is your current depletion, and can give you also data like when to irrigate and how much you need to irrigate. It's very, very nice model, but there are others, you know, uh, in use right now. So, What's irrigation management? Basically, I would like to estimate how much do I need to irrigate, how much is uh, my irrigation or the water amount, and when do I need to irrigate it? So you use soil moisture data along with weather and land data to estimate that. And I wanted to say there are lots of tools that you can find in, you know, like sensors and controllers, and as I said, irrigation models in the form of a simple application on your phone. And you can mix all this you know, to help you with decision making, making instead of deciding when to irrigate and how much by yourself based on your, you know, hand measurement, which is good by the way. I've seen lots of farmers very expert in that area. But if you can find help with that, give you like more accurate estimates, I think it will be great. So that's it for me for now. And if you have any question, let me know. Yeah, does, um, does WINS have a extension publication that you can print? Uh, no, but there is a paper about it, but we will work on an extension publication on how to use it and how to access it. Okay. We are, yeah, we are trying to prepare that, but there is a peer reviewed uh, publication. There is. Yeah, yeah, just, just published, uh, I think, a month ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. Okay, thank you.